So that moves us into the next stage, and uh, that will be our Okanagan Speaker Series. We have some other guests uh, as worship can come back in as well. I think we have Phil or Barry joining us, uh, representing uh, Okanagan College. This is uh, slipping into our monthly dialogue series. Uh, we are online still. Maybe we'll get some bets going when we get a live luncheon later this year. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes in the vaccination. We're pleased to have His Worship back with us again. Uh, again, if you have any questions, we have a number more folks that uh, have joined us now for this session. So a great turnout today. Thank you all for registering and participating in this uh, speaker series. If you have any functions at any time, please use the Q&A. And depending on time that we have with the mayor, we'll get to as many questions as you can. Um, and also, uh, I wanted to plug a few things before we get too far along that you should be aware of. As noted, there are resources available uh, for businesses, lots of them around, including through our OkanaganWeGotThis.com website. Also, we're taking a look at some great stories of resiliency of businesses throughout the Okanagan as they've responded and showed their grit during the pandemic. A couple of programs I really wanted to let you know because time is running out to register for them. Uh, we have the Building Resilience to Thrive program. The last, the fourth core cohort uh, is just getting underway. It's a great program delivered uh, by the BC Chamber. Uh, for you or your staff to get world-class customer service experience uh, and training. If you want to find out more about that one, just call the Chamber office. We also have a special session we're doing in partnership with the college and with uh, UBC Okanagan to give businesses and organizations more information on how you can tap into some great talent in this will fit in well with probably uh, the comments that Bill will provide. It's talent forward on the 30th at 1130, join us. It'll be a how to access some of this young talent, the various programs that exist and many of them government funded to help you. So if you're wondering about capacity for your organization, please join us next week. We're also pleased to be partnering again uh, with World Trade Center Vancouver in delivering TAP. It's the Trade Accelerator Program. We've coordinated with World Trade Center Vancouver to provide a special Okanagan cohort. It begins early April. Major bursaries are available for qualified applicants. It's valued at $4,500. The program itself is a $5,000 investment. But if you say the Kelowna Chamber sent you, they'll give you a $4,500 uh, bursary. And the deadline for that one, though, to apply for small and medium enterprises is March 30th. It's delivered by World Trade Center Vancouver in partnership with the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade. If you want more info, you can certainly contact the Kelowna Chamber. Another plug to our President's Circle members. Uh, we want to thank all four of them for their continued support as well as TD Benefits, our affinity partner, the Chamber Group Insurance Plan. Now I'm gonna turn things over and welcome Bill Gillett to bring some official greetings in, in a few moments. I mean, we are running behind. So Bill, I'll turn it over to you for a couple of quick comments. Yeah, very quick, thank you. Uh, uh, in, thank you for that, Dan. And uh, we as at the college are always happy to be able to sponsor the luncheon series in particular this particular lunch. Uh, with Mayor Bazran, and we appreciate your taking the time to do this. Uh, I'll say very briefly that as uh, there's a lot of excitement at the college, uh, as many of you know, uh, we've announced new residence uh, halls uh, on our campuses, including one in Kelowna, that will make uh, our opportunities much more available and give students some relief on housing, uh, which is always welcome. Um, you will also have likely have heard that uh, through Dr. Bonnie Henry uh, the, in the Ministry of Advanced Education that we will be back on campus in September. Uh, and they are telling us at this point that we will be back fully on campus with, um, although appropriate masks and uh, some restrictions will be in place, uh, we don't expect that we will have less than full classrooms. Uh, and enrollment for the School of Business is quite strong for the coming year. Uh, and I will also say, as always, our students uh, continue to perform in Excel. And on Friday, we received the news that uh, our students won two of the regional uh, competition pieces, one in 
um, entrepreneurship and one in uh, sustainability and affecting climate change with the Fruit Snaps program that many of you will be aware of. And also the students won the entrepreneurial pitch competition, which was not regional, but national on uh, Friday. So the Enactus team and our students continue to do great work. Uh, and we look forward to the mayor's comments today. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Bill uh, Gillett, the Dean of the Okanagan School of Business. Thanks for joining us. I'm gonna turn things over to Jeff to introduce his worship. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome his worship, Mayor Colin Vazran to be our speaker for today's luncheon. Most of you know that from 1995 to 2000, Mayor Vazran attended Okanagan College, uh, studying English and history. He then entered broadcast journalism at BCIT and graduated in 2002. After working for several years as a journalist and then a realtor, Mayor Bazran turned to politics, first serving on Kelowna City Council before being elected in 2014 as our mayor. He was re-elected in 2018 for a term that will see him through to 2022. Lately, Mayor Bazran has been at the forefront of efforts to solve several of the great challenges facing Kelowna and other urban communities of our province. He is the co-chair of the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus, and he has used that role to advocate for senior government support for many of the city's greatest needs. I'm excited to have Mayor Bazarin here today. There are so many great challenges facing our city and so many successes we can be proud of. Uh, he has a finger in many of them and I'm looking forward to what he can tell us about the past year and what we can look forward to going forward. Thank you and welcome Mayor Colin Bazran. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that introduction. Really appreciate it. Uh, just before I get started, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. And uh, this is the first time I've given this speech uh, virtually, and uh, I'm hoping it's the last, although uh, the way things are going, maybe virtual is the way forward, but certainly it's hard to beat uh, the energy of a room full of uh, you know, entrepreneurs and uh, people who are excited to uh, help build our economy and our community. So if there's a way to replicate that online, I'm all for it, but uh, I do say I miss being in, in the room with all of you. And uh, I know we're all looking forward to the day when uh, hopefully we can do those things again. Uh, and until such a day though, um, I do want to uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce for organizing this virtual opportunity to meet with you for an update on uh, City of Kelowna business. And uh, I see that, um, and I have Tom Wilson as always uh, here to help me out with my uh, PowerPoint. So uh, I believe it looks like it's been shared. So uh, fortunately for you, you don't have to look at my face the entire time that I'm talking. So thank you for that, Tom, and uh, here we go. So uh, I don't need to uh, dwell on it too much, but as you know, it's been a long year for everyone, uh, but there are signs of brighter days ahead for sure. So today I'll talk about how we did in 2020 and how 2021 is shaping up for us. There's certainly no sugarcoating it. It was a brutal year for some businesses, the arts, sports, not-for-profits, and for local governments. Our hearts go out to everyone who had to experience the effects of the virus firsthand. And I know we all applaud the healthcare workers and frontline workers who have done everything possible to help us get through this. As people involved in business, arts, sports, and volunteerism, you know your staff have also gone above and beyond to help keep things rolling. And I'd say the same thing for city staff, working to make essential services available, creating new online ways to do business, keeping recreation services safe, and responding to our community's needs in so many different ways. So we thank all our employees and residents for your resiliency and commitment to service and safety. Looking at what we were able to do during the pandemic, I'm so proud of how our community responded despite the anxiety. We worked together and figured out what needed to be done to keep our local economy alive. And I think thanks to those efforts, there are encouraging signs that indicate we could come out of this pandemic with some really strong momentum. For example, our population grew by 2% during a pandemic. After all, and our unemployment rate is lower now than it actually was pre-pandemic. The real estate market barely flinched during the pandemic. If you uh, have listed a place for sale or are trying to buy a place, you know exactly what I mean. On the residential development side, activity did slip compared to the five-year average but we also know the previous five years were the most active in our city's history with the highest ever construction values we've ever seen. While developers and builders did pull back on large scale residential, commercial and industrial projects, there was actually a modest increase in permit activity for smaller scale renovations 
and single family construction, which was a boon to our smaller businesses, contractors, and suppliers. Thanks to the smaller scale work and uninterrupted access to services provided by the city, permit volume was down less than 10% in 2020 compared to 2019. We've also seen employment numbers rebound in Kelowna after the low point of last April. While the bounce back was strong, Kelowna has the third highest employment rate in Canada, our hospitality, tourism, and other sectors will be challenged until our society opens up a lot more. Tourism Kelowna did a great job encouraging us to experience local activities, and I know they are absolutely ready to welcome visitors from outside of the area as soon as public health officials say it's safe to do so. I mentioned residential development and employment at the same time here because they are two essential ingredients to recovery and our continued prosperity in the years ahead. We all know that attracting qualified, talented staff was a challenge even pre-pandemic. And now working from home or working remotely has changed employment dynamics in a major way. But many of us think this new dynamic is going to give Kelowna a serious competitive advantage particularly after pandemic restrictions are lifted. Because let's be honest, if you can live in Kelowna and work remotely for a company located anywhere, why wouldn't you? All of Kelowna's attributes we've been trumpeting for the last decade are going to be more obvious and attractive than ever for people who want to live in a beautiful, progressive, energetic city. They are now more obvious than ever. Our lake, nature, climate, wide open spaces, Outstanding amenities like golf, skiing, biking, hiking, boating, our entrepreneurial energy, our foodie culture, our wine. I'll put the list of reasons to move here up against anywhere else in Canada or the world for that matter. We all know this because we live here and many have raised the question of whether we need to attract more people to Kelowna. To that I say they're coming whether we invite them or not. The word is out and Kelowna post-pandemic looks even better than ever to people from across Canada and around the world. And these new residents, and an estimated 45,000 of them in the next 20 years, will help bring us closer to what our residents told us through Imagine Kelowna, what they want our city to be like in the future. They want a diverse and energetic community that reflects our best qualities and values. Multicultural, entrepreneurial, artistic, active, respectful, accepting, and inclusive. That's why it's so important for people to get involved in the OCP update currently underway, so that we address one of our biggest obstacles to that vision, our city's affordability challenge. Because again, the local housing market has a huge impact on our ability to recruit and retain talent. Real estate is a supply and demand driven market, but we work with partners to create incentives to nudge supply toward what a large number of people need. That's help, uh, helped us encourage more, uh, more rental housing development. We've added more than 2,000 rental units in just the last five years. Plus, we continue to follow through on helping the development community fill in that missing middle of housing options for people who are not at the high end nor the low end of the house buying spectrum. Our learning institutions are also expanding, as you've heard. There are housing options for students who come from across Canada and around the world to continue their education here. UBCO will develop its exciting downtown campus on Doyle Avenue, including housing for students, along with public spaces and learning opportunities integrated into our downtown core. And as you heard, Okanagan College just received approval for another 216 beds of student housing to its Kelowna campus. We need to attract these students and retain them when they graduate, and we need that continuum of housing options. So we will stay focused on encouraging the kinds of homes, condos, townhomes, duplexes, and so on that are affordable to the people we need to move here. It's a big challenge and we need the help of higher levels of government as well. But progress is happening and we will continue and it will continue to happen. A good way to keep track of this progress is on, on our priorities such as housing is to visit council priorities at Kelowna.ca and view the progress reports. I expect we will continue to see good things that started because of the pandemic carry over into our new reality as well. For example, council just endorsed moving forward with the Bernard Avenue closure for vehicles, uh, two vehicles for the summer. A move that proved very popular last year 
And now that we've had more time to do some more planning, we'll be even better this year. Also, thanks to COVID-19, most of our services, including payments, are now available online. We also know, thanks to the pandemic, how valuable our parks and active transportation corridors are. For example, the sensor on the Okanagan Rail Trail at Parkinson Rec Center counted 55,000 people last May, and it stayed around 50,000 for each month of the summer, which smashed the previous high traffic volume of 43,000 in May of the previous year. The investment in these open spaces and pathways have proven their value, and those investments will continue in 2021 with projects such as the extension of the Ethel Street and Abbott Street corridors this summer. As our city becomes more densely populated, these investments will be so important to people living in our urban centers. We just have to look at the popularity of the Stewart Park skating rink this winter. Even with the extra step of reserving ice time online to understand how important these investments are to our sense of place and in particular our well-being. In all, the city's capital spending for this year is going to be just over $60 million the vast majority of which is spent right here in Kelowna helping to keep people employed and keeping our economy moving. Providing these services and funding essential capital projects have been a challenge, but we've had many other behind the scenes efforts as well to help us today and position us for success in the future. One of those during this year of pivoting has been the advances we've made in opening lines of communication at a time when we're keeping our distance from each other and working from home. I don't think we've ever been as interconnected as a community with other local governments, business organizations, interior health, tourism, WorkSafe BC and others as we've shared information and coordinated reactions to the virus. Early in the pandemic, the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission worked with the West Bank First Nation, the city of Kelowna and other local governments to develop a plan to weather the storm in the short term and emerge stronger in the long term. We've said early on that we are going to take a team approach to posi positioning our region to speak loudly and clearly with one voice to other levels of government. It's a coordinated approach that has paid off. The EDC's 45 member advisory council representing every business sector and every local community served us well during this huge challenge. Our advocacy helped secure a $7.3 million safe restart grant to help keep transit service available, safe and affordable. And we received another $7.9 million from the Safe Restart Grant for the City of Kelowna from the federal and provincial governments. That grant helped us reduce the tax rate at final budget during a year when our revenue sources dropped. Those funds also helped us cover additional costs and revenue losses experienced last year from areas such as gaming revenues and allowed us to support essential services, including helping Kelowna International Airport through a, an obvious drastic decline in air travel. YLW is one of our most important municipal assets and will be crucial to our economic recovery. Through the pandemic, the airport team has adjusted to the challenges in many ways. Cost control measures, deferring capital projects, rapid screening tests, working with service providers and tenants to keep up with changes and maintain essential air ambulance services. And, um, and the YLW team has also been involved in advocating at the federal level for a plan to ensure Canada has a strong competitive air sector after the pandemic. A recent announcement from the provincial government for some financial assistance to regional airports is a welcome start, but for a national industry that has so far experienced a $5.5 billion decline in revenues, a lot more needs to be done. While the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission Task Force was speaking with one voice, BC's urban mayors got together to form another advocacy group speaking on larger social and economic priorities. The BC Urban Mayors Caucus published the Blueprint for British Columbia's Urban Future, which outlines four key priorities for urban communities across the province. The four key pillars are mental health, substance use and treatment, affordable housing, public transit, and a new fiscal relationship with the provincial government. The first three priorities on the list speak for themselves. We know we need improved approaches to address social issues, housing affordability, and transit expansion. The last priority, a new fiscal framework, is really important and relevant to municipalities' needs. 
The pandemic, however, highlighted how municipalities are so reliant on property taxes to take care of everything our residents want. I've spoken with Premier Horgan directly on this and he had given his commitment to have more discussion toward a new fiscal framework for municipal funding. Local government received eight cents of every tax dollar collected, but are responsible for roughly 60% of the infrastructure in British Columbia. Local governments need an expanded set of sustainable, predictable and reliable funding tools to address the needs of our growing communities, upgrade aging infrastructure and create accessible and sustainable cities. Victoria Mayor Lisa Helps and I co-chair this group and we have been very encouraged by the Premier's receptiveness to discussion and making his ministers available for detailed conversations about how we can do better. I also want to thank the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce Board for endorsing the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus um, BC Blueprint. And I also know that our three local MLAs, including I do believe um, MLA Merrifield is uh, in attendance this afternoon. Um, I've had very great conversations with the three of them who I know will also champion uh, the municipality's needs uh, in, their, in their great advocacy work as well. As I said earlier about advocacy and speaking with one voice, the EDC and the BC Mayor's Caucus are very much laying the groundwork for potential benefits for years to come. For example, the most current advocacy activity of the Economic Development uh, Task Force is pushing for Kelowna to be the location for a new Canada Regional Development Agency. And the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce has also been very instrumental in this advocacy work. I have been in conversation with Federal Minister Melanie Jolie about Kelowna being the perfect place for this agency. And we have additional meetings planned to advance our position as the best place in BC for this agency. It's an opportunity that can help shape the region's economic future and provide on the ground support to one of BC's fastest growing regional economies. No other place in BC can compete with Kelowna's unique combination of lifestyle and leisure while offering the benefits of a thriving local economy. Canada and BC are still very much in the response phase to the pandemic and planning the transition to recovery. But I can assure you that council and staff are working every day to position ourselves to come out of this crisis stronger and push for better responses to the social and economic hurdles that have held us back for too long. As usual though, out of a crisis, I expect Kelowna will emerge stronger and better prepared to meet the challenges ahead. We're not there yet, but with spring in the air, vaccines rolling out, possible loosening health restrictions in the months ahead, our local coordination and advocacy efforts, better days are coming. Until then, let's all continue to be careful and not get ahead of ourselves. Keep up the fundamental virus protection measures and we'll all look forward to a return to better times sooner than later. Thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I look forward to taking your questions. Well, thanks very much, Your Worship, and I'll uh, likely bring uh, President Jeff back in uh, as well. So we will open it up. Uh, thanks again for your patience. We're a little slow off the start. So thanks, Your Worship, no for hang hanging with us. Uh, do you have a few moments to take some questions? Yeah, I can take some few questions, absolutely. So people can use the Q&A or the chat uh, function if you wish to pose a question. Um, I will wait for people to do that. And while I'm doing, I will remind folks, we do have those door prizes. So I raced past the top of the hour and I was gonna give a couple of door prizes. But what we do have is nice gift baskets that we'll be giving away to as door prizes from Sandhill, which brings me to a question that most recently council had a proposal with the culinary school. I wonder if you could just bring us up to date. Uh, I know it's uh, dealt with just recently uh, by council, but uh, I think it's worthwhile sharing. It's in the news now, if you could share some of that perspective. Sure, so um, for those who maybe uh, aren't familiar with this application, it was a, an application brought forward by Summerhill Winery to uh, build a, a sort of a culinary school and um, culinary tourism uh, project on the winery site. Um, and so council has approved that moving forward to the Agricultural Land Commission for their decision uh, because the winery obviously is in the Agricultural Land Reserve. And uh, so that will now be in the hands of the Agricultural Land Commission, but council did uh, give it, uh, I guess, if you will, a preliminary approval. Um, and if it uh, is approved by the Agricultural Land Commission, then it will come back to council for an additional approval on the form and character of the building. 
Um, it is a substantial, um, substantially sized building, 150 beds, uh, something we've never seen in the Okanagan, in fact, probably the country. Um, but no surprise that uh, Summerhill, um, given the uh, owner's uh, visionary leadership, um, you would, uh, you're not, you know, I'm not surprised that they're trying something that uh, maybe hasn't been done before. But anyway, long story short, it's been approved by council and is now off to the Agricultural Land Commission for their decision. Good. So we do have, uh, I want to yield to the questions that uh, for the participants, so feel free to jump in. Uh, the mayor has availed his uh, self uh, for some time here to answer any questions. We do have one uh, from Claire who asked, do you expect to see things like scooter rentals and bike rentals to come back to the downtown space this summer? Uh, so e-scooters, yes. Um, pe pedal bikes, likely not. Uh, so there actually aren't any um, market commercial bike operators in the country. Uh, any bike rental operators that are uh, in Canada are usually in larger cities and they are heavily subsidized. So I would say right now there is not an appetite for the city of Kelowna to subsidize a bike rental program. Uh, however, there will be e-scooter uh, rentals available. And for those who maybe haven't heard, it was just announced this morning, the city of Kelowna will be one of uh, a few hand uh, um, pilot communities where uh, our bike lanes on municipally owned streets are now going to uh, be open to e-scooters. So people will be able to utilize the bike lanes now for e-scooters, whereas previously you weren't. That's why you only saw them on a private property like City of Kelowna owned property, property on our waterfront and in City Park. Uh, people will now be able to utilize the bike lanes for e-scooters, which we're hoping uh, will not only be a tourist novelty, but as a result of opening up the bike lanes, which means now opening it up to all neighborhoods, is we hope that there will be some people who use e-scooters now as their normal way of getting around, particularly during the warmer months. So we'll have to see, and that's part of the reason for the pilot project, but it's just opening up one more way for people in our community to get around. All right, so we'll still uh, leave it open. Uh, if people want to move on, we will move on. I won't keep it going uh, too much longer. Uh, but uh, Jeff, I'll maybe come to you for, uh, for a question in a moment and then wrap up. Um, I do have one question uh, somewhat related with respect to the rail trail. I think we've, well, I think just recently there was an announcement of how many bikes are looking to be purchased. So, you know, when you think about recreational opportunities, and the rail trail is such a regional asset and the city of Kelowna has certainly shown its leadership in bringing the region together to, to make that happen. Uh, but there's still a little bit uh, that needs to be uh, completed with respect to making that final connection. Is there any information that you're able to share of how that is moving along uh, around the airport to make that final connection? Yeah, unfortunately it's out of the municipality's hands, but I do know that our, our previous MP, Fuhr, and now our current MP, uh, Tracy Gray have done a very good job of advocating to uh, have the portion of land that's located on uh, Okanagan Indian Band Reserve or, or land um, return to reserve. And, and that's what we're waiting on is we're waiting for that portion to be uh, given what's called reserve status. Um, and then the Okanagan Indian Band has said that they would participate in the rail trail initiative. Um, however, it's uh, waiting for a federal process to uh, return it to reserve status. And um, that is not an easy undertaking. Um, it is very complex because uh, along part of that portion, uh, there is city infrastructure, which services our industrial land out uh, near the border of Lake Country. So it's, uh, it's a tricky uh, negotiation and work, but it is ongoing. And, um, but I can't give you a, an estimate on time at this point, but uh, we continue to advocate for it to, uh, to hurry up um, because we know a lot of people uh, really wanna see uh, that link um, fixed or, or added. Um, it is a, a big missing part of that uh, tremendous uh, amenity. All right, we've got a few more questions come in, so I'll go to those. Uh, Amber asks, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the downtown core business community and perhaps how the chamber uh, can help tackle that challenge? What, what's the biggest issue and maybe even a broader perspective of you know, what's the biggest issue that's facing in light of uh, the pandemic? So the downtown core and business community and Sure. Um, well, I, I'll, I'm actually going to talk about probably what well, it is, the top priority of the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus, and that is uh, social issues and in particular um, housing and supports for uh, what we're calling residents with complex needs. So those would be residents with uh, significant mental health and addiction issues, 
who um, have, whose issues are so severe that they actually um, don't uh, fit into the current model of supportive housing being offered up by the provincial government. And as a result of that, those people are on our streets. Uh, they're a danger to themselves. Uh, they are a danger to the public at times, um, but they also um, decrease the perception of safety in our downtown cores. And this is um, the top priority of the 13 municipalities who are in the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus. And we are making some good headway with the provincial government on um, creating a model of care for those residents um, in order to get them off our streets. But I see that as being a major um, issue for our downtown businesses, uh, as well as for our, our community at large. And so that is our top focus right now. Uh, and, uh, and we hope to have some good news in this upcoming provincial budget, where there will be budget allocated to the first of their kind, uh, complex care housing facilities, so that we can get people who are currently on our streets, like I say, who don't fit in the current supportive housing model, into housing, but also more importantly, getting them the help that they need through the appropriate supports. All right, uh, we have uh, one with respect to a, a specific question. I'm not sure, uh, I don't wanna put you on the spot. The diversity of the arts are important to all of us. The statue of Chief Sukum Shoots is, there you go. So you know better than I. Um, recognition of the artists uh, in particular. So there's a question about that. Do you, do you have any knowledge of efforts to beautify uh, that piece of art or efforts to do that? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I quite understand the question, but I do know that there's like a statement of significance that's going to be added soon. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what they mean, but uh, the statue itself is actually quite beautiful and it's a great piece of art done by uh, Crystal Cheville, who's done some other great work in our community. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's what they're asking, but there's going to be a statement of significance um, put up, uh, like, actually, I thought it was up already, to be honest, uh, but it, it's pretty much, it's imminent. So I, I think that, I hope answers their question. I think you're 100% answered the question, so that's great, thanks. Uh, that was exactly it. So uh, Jeff, I'm not sure if you wanted to cover one issue before we wrap up. Well, one thing I, I've heard, um, question asked about is uh, the Tolco site and and for those that don't know I think it is city-owned property uh, and if you could provide our members with an update as to you know, what the direction is for that site. Uh, so as of now and, and I'm only uh, you know so, so there's ongoing uh, communication with City of Kelowna staff and uh, the owners of the mill uh, but right now there's uh, and I think I just saw a news article on one of our local media outlets about the fact that uh, there's still uh, remediation work and reports that need to be done. And um, th they're asking for, I believe, an extension of a year to, to continue that work. Um, so there's a lot of things that still need to happen before we start uh, any major planning exercises or uh, get too excited about what the future will hold. So I would say, given the fact that, um, you know, there, a lot of remediation still needs to take place and, and decommissioning of the mill, um, I'll be I'll be fortunate if uh, this council gets to make any decisions on the Tolco site with the, the remaining time in this term. Um, it's going to be a, a ways off yet, um, so no no update in terms of a purchaser or anything like that that I can share. Uh, there are no um, work plans at the moment by planning staff to begin comprehensively planning it uh, because until we know who's going to be owning it, um, yeah, there's there's really no um, there's nothing that really can happen at this time. Uh, other than just being in constant communication with them uh, in regards to uh, you know what their plans may be. But as of now, uh, it's not for sale, hasn't been sold, and a lot of work on site still needs to take place. So unfortunately, uh, while we all recognize the tremendous opportunity it's gonna have to make our city even better, um, it's gonna be a, a, a long time yet. So uh, please be patient, but no, no exciting uh, nuggets of information at this point, Jeff, sorry. And by extension, if I could build on that, uh, Your Worship, with respect to the OCP, because uh, one of the issues we identified in, in looking at the draft uh, is industrial land and, and, and areas for industry to grow within the municipal boundaries. So uh, is there still opportunity to provide input? I know you've, you've got a draft now, it's moving forward. And, and your perspective, if there are any issues that you flagged or do you want to wait to get the input and then council will deal with that at the end. So industry, uh, OCP opportunity for input, if you could make a quick sure. comment. Yeah, certainly uh, making sure we have enough industrial land to continue to grow our economy is uh, absolutely top of mind. And so uh, our, our long-term planning staff are, are well aware of that. 
and um, and we hope that it will be um, uh, yeah addressed in this official community plan moving forward. Uh, there is opportunities for input, and right now um, is one of those times. So there is opportunity for input online, as well as I know that staff are engaging major stakeholders in uh, online meetings like this um, and uh, and getting feedback as well. So there's that opportunity. Um, so certainly, yes, we want your input in terms of um, issues that I've. Uh, that are sort of near and dear to me or, or things that I see of uh, imminent concern at the moment. Um, yeah, I think some of those have already been addressed. I mean, we've talked about it and there's, you know, there's been debate and not everyone is in agreement with perhaps um, the uh, limiting, if you will, of uh, suburban neighborhoods uh, and trying to direct as much growth as we can into our urban core. Um, we believe that in this next OCP, um, if the OCP goes the way we'd like it to. Uh, as of now, there's well over 10 years of single family home inventory of lots available. Um, but if we can direct um, more of that uh, of our new residents into our core, it will stretch out that inventory even further. Um, but we'll have to see what consumption patterns are post pandemic. Um, and, and so that's something that we're gonna continue to monitor. Um, so certainly it's not uh, obviously, um, yeah, it's not set in stone. Uh, there, it's open for uh, for feedback, and uh, and then council will uh, give it endorsement later on in 2021 once it's gone through the public engagement process. One of the things that the chamber and some of our members have flagged uh, of concern is around that uh, suburban boundaries and whether decisions made uh, by the city will impact what happens on the periphery communities, uh, particularly Lake Country and West Kelowna, which are right on our boundaries. Yeah. Uh, there's there's an old line in the Lower Mainland, you drive till you qualify um, and you drive the further out the valley it is and that's what's resulted in that sprawl. So is, is that an issue? Are you working with other local governments to, you know, as the city of Kelowna deals with its OCP, look at that regional growth strategies? You can't force others to do, uh, you know, make decisions that would prevent yeah. that growth, but that is a reality that I guess the city of Kelowna needs to be aware of, right? Uh, absolutely, and so we do work with our neighboring municipalities uh, through the regional growth strategy, and just from st and then staff to staff. And, and I think the one thing I want to be mindful of because one of the things we did here uh, early on when we said, okay, let's maybe put a, a limit on suburban growth uh, or suburban neighborhoods, is well that will just push growth uh, to other communities who want to find single-family neighborhoods. Again, I want to reiterate, um, we're not running out of single-family lots tomorrow. Uh, there is well over ten years of inventory currently and if we are like i say if we're even partly successful in getting more people to live in our core it's going to stretch out that inventory even longer so it's not like we're saying no you can't live here you have you and we're forcing people to live elsewhere there is a lot of inventory already approved um or uh, either through zoning or in the ocp for future development so I want to make that very clear. But yes, will we be mindful of that as that inventory is utilized? 100%. Um, we definitely will. And we are very mindful when we work with our municipal partners that um, we don't want to, uh, while we may be um, achieving some of our goals, making it worse um, by you know, spreading the problem somewhere else. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, I'm not sure if there's anything further or do you want to just move in uh, mindful of uh, his worship's time and he's been very gracious with it today. Anything further, Jeff? And no, those are uh, the question I, I had. Uh, and, and the mayor, of course, has been very open with us and on our chamber board uh, to, to have a few meetings with him and the city manager. And, and it's a great relationship. So if, if our members have other questions, please reach out to our policy chair uh, and we'll see if we can get those answers from the city. Uh, so Mayor Bazran, thank you again for your leadership. Thank you again for the, the great overview. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate hearing the excitement uh, and, and the anticipation for what's coming for Kelowna. Uh, I am firmly in the camp that believes the pandemic will be a long-term benefit to Kelowna yeah. and that people want to be here because it's the best place to be. So thank you again, and I wish you the best of luck for the balance of your term. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And just as we conclude, uh, I was a little late in getting to it, but we are going to give out uh, the uh, packages from Sand Hill uh, to Stacy Vincent, Natalie Corbett, and Mike Jacobs. So if you three are online, please send us an email at, uh, you can send it to me if you want, uh, dan at colonachamber.org to verify you just heard that you've won. That's Stacy, Natalie, and Mike. 
and we'll make sure you get it. If I don't hear from you, we'll move on to the others that were on the list to give out those three fabulous uh, door prizes. And thanks to Sandhill, a uh, proud uh, chamber member. Thanks uh, again for all of you for joining us today. It's uh, been a lengthy session as we tied in our AGM as well as our speaker series. Thanks to his worship and Bill Gillett, uh, the Dean of Okanagan School of Business for joining us. We look forward to uh, having you uh, next month for our speaker series online. Thanks and have a great day.